Well, hello, Connect. Welcome to Wednesday Night Prayer. Worship band, thank you so much. You don't have to stand here all service. Um, it's good to be in the house of God. It's an, it's an honor. It's a privilege to be here tonight. And um, I'm excited for, for what God is doing in this church and in this new year. And I believe it's, it's because of prayer. We're a praying church. We're a church that believes in prayer. And these kind of services, I believe, are the reason why God is doing such a big move in our church and in Springfield. So welcome to Wednesday Night Prayer. My name is Roman. Um, and I'm, it's an honor, it's a privilege to be here tonight and to stand here tonight. Um, this past Sunday, Moses kicked off a series called One Small Step. One Small Step. Very powerful message. If you were not here, I would suggest you go back and listen to it. Um, just a phenomenal, phenomenal message. And today we're going to be continuing talking about small steps. Uh, as Moses said, our destinies are defined by day-to-day decisions. So today we're going to be talking about small steps, and we're going to be in the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua, chapter 6, if you have your Bible. Open with me if you don't. It's on the screens. Joshua Chapter 6 says this. Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a loud, a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. <clears throat> pray with me real quick. Father God, I pray, Lord, in these few moments that we have, Lord, I pray, speak to us. God, I pray, let let me just fade away, God, and let us hear from you. God, I pray, may may this not be my thoughts, my ideas, God, but let us truly hear from you. And I pray, Holy Spirit, speak to us. We love you, we honor you, and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, this time of year, many many pastors, many preachers uh, are talking about, you know, New Year's resolutions, dreams, goals, ambitions that we have, and... You know, and the truth is they're, they're good, and all of us, whether we admit it or not, have some kind of resolution, some kind of goal, some kind of dream for this year, for our life, or whatever it may be. We have things we want to accomplish. We have things we want to do. We, we, we have things we want to be, the kind of people we want to become. We all have ambitions. We all have goals. We all have dreams. But the reality is, unless we every day get up and walk it out and take step after step, we, all those dreams will remain dreams. Unless we begin to actually do something, all that stuff will just remain somewhere in the future. And, and, and this is kind of why we're doing this series, to encourage those first steps, to encourage that, the, those seemingly meaningless little steps along the way that will actually bring us to where we want to go. And, that, and we all have dreams, we all have goals, and, and, and that includes the physical, and that also includes the spiritual. We, we have things we want to do physically, you know, hitting the gym, whatever it may be. We have things we want to do spiritually, the kind of people we want to become, what, what kind of character we want to have. You know, maybe like reading the Bible or prayer. We all have goals. We all have dreams. And, and, and I want to start off by telling you, God has a plan for you. I, I, I want to start this off by saying that God has a dream for you as well. God has a plan for you. Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus speaks, and he says, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and more abundantly. You see, God has a plan for you. And Jesus says, the enemy, he has one goal. One goal consisting of three parts. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to steal from you in this life. He wants to take your life and destroy you for eternity. But he says, but I came. That you would have life and life more abundantly. You see, he's not just talking about heaven. And make no mistake, he's talking about heaven. He's talking about eternity. But he's also saying in this life, I came that you would have life and have it more abundantly. 
And so many times we think abundant life and we think stuff. We think houses, we think cars, we think whatever it may be. But there are so many people that have it all. Look at Hollywood. They have everything, more money than they know what to do with, yet they're depressed and suicidal. Jesus is saying, listen, I came to give you life and more abundantly, meaning I want to give you meaning to life. I want to give you hope. I want to give you a future. I want to give you a plan. I, I want to answer that question of why am I here? God has a plan for you. God has a plan for me. You see, in the same way, God had a plan and a promise for Israel. And he spoke to them and he said, I'm going to lead you out. I'm going to give you this promised land, this land flowing with milk and honey. I'm, I'm going to lead you out. He leads them out of Egypt. The story of Moses is just a phenomenal story. He leads them out of Egypt through the Red Sea. And then Moses dies off. Now Joshua is the leader. And they come to this first place called Jericho. You see, Jericho wasn't, wasn't a massive city, but it was a very well guarded city. It had huge walls, and from the human perspective, it's just impenetrable. There's no way to get in. And as we see, the people of God approach Jericho. And from verse 1, we see now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out, none came in. So they come, and Jericho is actually on lockdown because of Israel. And can I tell you today, could it be that that enemy that you're so afraid of, that thing, that wall that looks so big, that thing that looks so like, impossible, that thing that you're so afraid of, that thing that looks so daunting to you, could it be that the, that enemy is actually afraid of you? And could it be that that enemy is actually on lockdown because he knows he doesn't have much longer? And there, that enemy that you think is just so impossible, this wall that looks so unscalable, the enemy is actually hiding behind knowing his days are numbered. I want to tell you, God has a plan for you. I don't know who you are today, but God has a plan for you. And it's interesting, as we continue reading, see, verse 2 for me is out of context. Not out of context, out of place. Because if I were writing the Bible, I would put verse 2 after 20. Would they have the victory? I'd put verse 2. But you see, God puts it here. It's interesting. It says, And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. They approach this wall, this guarded city, that they can't get in in any way, shape, or form. And God says, See, ta-da, I have given you Jericho. See, if I'm Joshua, I'm like, uh, God, we're out here, there and there. What are you talking about? But you see, our God is the only one that can speak of the future in past tense. Our God is the only one that can declare something as done that hasn't happened yet. You see, he's not restricted by time. He created time. He's outside of time. And so he sees it in completion. He knows exactly. And for us, the future is the future. But for him, it's already the past. He knows exactly what's going to happen, and he can declare, and he can say, I have given you the victory. I have done it. It is done. You are more than conquerors already, even though you can't see it, even though I can't see it. God says, I declare, it's done. It's already done. See, if I'm Joshua, I'm like, okay, cool. Sounds good. Are you going to give us some crazy weapons, you know, some tanks? Maybe haven't been invented yet, some lightning bolts. How are we going to do this? And God's like, okay, Joshua. We're going to walk. Do nothing. In fact, you're not even going to say anything. And you're just going to get up every day and walk. And you're going to walk and walk and walk. And on the seventh day, you're going to walk seven times. And then you're just going to yell. That's the battle plan. That, that, that's what I'm telling you to do. You know, in reality, sometimes to be obedient to God, sometimes to see our breakthrough, we have to look foolish in front of people. Sometimes to see what God has for us, sometimes to see through the plan and purpose and vision of God for our life, to be obedient to what he says, we have to do things that make no sense to people around us. You see, I, I, I can just imagine they're walking. They can't even talk. God says, just be quiet and walk. I can imagine the insults coming their way from Jericho. I can imagine the people saying, like, these guys aren't even doing anything. They're just, they're just walking but Israel's just being obedient, 
saying, I know what my God said, and I'm just going to be obedient. Obedient to what he said. And as we see later in the story, they walk around. On the seventh day, they walk seven times. They shout, and the walls fall down. And the people of God go, and, and they have a victory. But the truth is, they would never have had this victory if every single day they didn't get up and step after step, walked in obedience to what God said, not seeing anything happen, just step after step. You know why so many people quit? Because for us, oftentimes progress isn't always visible. And, and, and we're walking and we're doing and, and we're praying and we're believing and, and, and we're doing what we're supposed to do. We're obedient, but nothing's happening. Progress isn't always visible, you know. I'm eating healthy. I'm eating broccoli and kale and all that other junk. But nothing. What's going on? I, I, I'm believing. I'm talking to my kids. But nothing's happening. What is happening? I'm trying at work, but nothing's happening. Can I say progress isn't always visible? So God has a dream. God has a plan for us. But every single day we must begin to get up and walk it out. Get up and step after step in obedience to what God said. If it makes sense or it doesn't make sense, I'm going to walk it out step by step. So I want to I wanna look at today how. How do I take this, this vision, this dream, this plan, whatever it is that I have, and how do I walk it out? What, what do I have to do in my life to achieve what God wants for me? The first thing we must do is have a vision. I mean, I know it sounds kind of simple, but, but the truth is we must have a vision for our life. We must have a vision for the kind of people we want to be. We must have a vision, and, and that is only found in God. That is only found in your time alone with the Word and in prayer, where you, where you are just seeking God and getting more into Him and hearing His voice. Proverbs 29, 18 says this, where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained, but happy is he who keeps the law. Where there is no vision, there's no restraint. But when I have a vision, when I have a goal, when I have a dream, when I'm moving towards something, I don't restrain myself from things. I restrain myself for something. You see, when an Olympian knows his dream is one day to stand on that podium and to see the flag go up and to hear his anthem, that's all he dreams about, to get that medal. You know, when his friends call him up at 11 o'clock p.m. and say, hey, let's go get a burger. He's like, you know what? Not for me. When everyone's still asleep, they get up at 4 a.m. and run for miles and miles. And they're restraining themselves and doing things that we think is insane. But because they have a vision and this vision motivates them, this vision moves them, this vision motivates them to do things that normal people just wouldn't do. Because vision will begin to guide your life. If you have a vision of the kind of father you want to be, of the kind of husband, the kind of mother, the, the, the kind of coworker, the kind of friend, whatever it is, if you have a vision for your life, it will begin to dictate what you do and what you don't do. And you will be restraining yourself, not because, you know, you don't want to or you're fighting it, but because you have a vision and it's moving you towards something. And you're going to say no to some things and yes to other things. And you're going to begin to take step after step after this vision. The second thing we must do is take the first step. It seems simple. But the truth is this. You don't have to be great to start. But you have to start to be great. You don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great. Everything started somewhere. Everything started somewhere. Every business, every successful person, every church, everything started somewhere. And we must take the first step to see the vision come to life. Zechariah 4.10 says this. Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Do not despise small beginnings because God loves to see, you, to see the work begin. You see, we as humans, we value results. We value the end. We value the podium. We value the, the success. We value the highs. 
But God says, I'm interested in everything. I'm interested in the process. I'm interested in the steps. And I'm excited when you begin. Parents in this room, think back to when your child first began to walk. And you, and you picked them up, and they took one step and fell down. And then you picked them up again, they took one step, another step, and fell down. You see, in that moment, you didn't freak out. Well, hopefully you didn't. You're a horrible parent if you did. But most of us, right, we don't freak out. Most of you didn't freak out and say, you are a horrible walker. Are you kidding me? There are people running. People are jogging. You can't even walk. No, as a parent, you get all excited. It's on Instagram everywhere. Yeah, my kid took a step. It's not impressive at all. But he took a step. And you get so pumped. I believe God in heaven gets so pumped and so excited, pulls out his camera and says, come on. They took a step. I gave them a vision, and they started walking. I gave them a vision, and they began believing. I gave them a vision, and they, they didn't understand everything, but they just began to march around this wall saying, I believe that God will come through. I believe God celebrates the process. If you get nothing today, get this. God is way more interested in the process than the destination. God is so much more interested in the process and seeing you grow and develop then he is just reaching the destination because he knows when you get to this destination, he wants to get you ready. He wants to, he wants to work on you and mold you so that when you get to this place that he's calling you to do, you won't be crushed by it, but you'll be ready for it. Don't, don't hate the process. God wants to work on us. God wants to mold us. God wants us to be ready for whatever it is he's calling us to. I have a daughter, she's six months. She's the cutest baby in the world, and that's non-negotiable. But you see, I love my daughter. I also love steak. I'm going somewhere, don't worry. You see, she's a very attentive baby, and she sits there and watches us eat all the time. And you know, and I'll be cutting into my steak and, and eating, and she's just watching us, and she's opening her mouth. And listen, I want her to have steak. I like steak, and because I'm going to raise her right, she's going to eat meat. But I want this for her. But what kind of father would I be if I gave a six-month-old a nice, juicy ribeye? She's not ready for it. Her body isn't ready for it. She has no teeth. She's just not ready. Even though I want this for her, and she wants it too, she's not ready. You see, God is a good father. And even though he wants something for you, and even though you may want it too, maybe it's just not the time. And he's saying, can you just trust my process? Can you just trust and walk and know that I'm developing you, and I'm working on you, and I'm doing something in you, and you will get there, I promise. But just trust that what I'm doing is good for you. And the third and final thing, very simply, we must trust God. I know it sounds cliche and very Christianese, but Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. We must trust in God. When we begin to place our hope and our trust in God, what we are saying is, you are God, and I am not. And even though none of this makes sense, even though this marching doesn't make sense, God, I'm going to put one foot in front of the other and trust that you can do what I cannot do. I will do what I can do. I will walk in faith. I will do what I can do. But I will trust that you will do what I can't. You see, everyone in the Bible followed these three simple steps. We see the story of Gideon. God gives him a vision. He says, listen, there's a huge army, and you're going to defeat it. They're oppressing Israel, but you're going to defeat it. And Gideon's like, sweet, let's do this. And then he begins to walk it out. He gets an army, and God says, nah, smaller, smaller, 
smaller. They come down to 300 men. God's like, all right, you're getting some pots and pans, torches, go to war. And they're walking, and they're walking in obedience. This doesn't make sense, God. This isn't how you fight armies, God. But I'm going to do it, and I'm going to go. And they, and they simply trusted God. And they had the victory. They didn't even have to fight. David was anointed king. He had a vision. He had a dream. David is anointed king. But then his process started. He had to go through. He had to fight bears and lions, deliver crackers to his brothers, face Goliath, walk around trusting God, running from Saul who's trying to kill him. In obedience, just walking and walking and walking until finally God's dream came to pass. Joseph, Joseph is given a dream. Joseph, you're going to be in command in Egypt. You're going to do all this great stuff. But then his process started. And Joseph has highs, Joseph has lows. And in all this step after step, he's just walking in obedience to God and trusting God that he knows what he's doing. Can I have the band join me? And as we see in this story that we read today, the story of Israel and Jericho, you see God tells them, this is for you. You have this. But then he says, now walk. And step after step, take one small step in front of the other in obedience to what I'm telling you to do. Just walk and walk and walk. And they trusted God. That God, I will do what I can do. God, I will walk in obedience. God, I will do the little things. I will take step after step. I will walk around this wall while people are hurling insults at me. God, I will just walk and I will do what you told me to do. And I will trust that you will do what I can't. And they see the walls fall. All over the Bible, God is so much more interested in our obedience. God is so much more interested in the process. You don't have to have it all figured out. I don't know what you want to achieve today. I don't know who you are. I don't know what dream God has planted inside of you. I don't know what you want to become, but I want to tell you this. It will begin with step after step obedience to God. It will begin in a process where God will mold you and grow you. And sometimes we don't like it Some, because we just want to be there. We want the destination. We want to arrive, but God says, I want to work on you. God says, I want you to trust in me. I, you will get there, but there's a process. We're going to go into a time of prayer. And I don't know who you are in this room today. Maybe you don't know God at all. Maybe you don't know Jesus at all. I want to tell you that 2,000 years ago, he stepped off his throne, came into this world, put on flesh, and died on a cross to pay for your and my sins. And today he's offering you salvation. And today he's offering you life and life more abundantly. He's offering you hope. He's offering you meaning. So today when we go into prayer, maybe you've never prayed this prayer before, go to God and pray. Make him your Lord and Savior. Acknowledge your need for him. If you would let us know by texting the word follow to 97,000 or fill out a connect card. Also, maybe there's some of you tonight and you're here in this room and, and you know the plan of God. You know that, that, that God has given you promises. God has told you things. But today you're just tired. You're tired of marching. You're tired of walking. You're tired of going in and, and fighting and believing and walking. And nothing is happening. Can I tell you today? Just keep walking. I know it sounds, you know, it's easier said than done. But if we put one step in front of the other in obedience and we trust that he knows what he's doing, he will bring it to completion. He will bring it about. We're going to open these altars today. Maybe some of you today, you don't have any kind of vision. You're a Christian, but you're just getting by in life. You just come and go. And you, I want to tell you today, God has a more abundant life for you. God has something more for you. And today, it can be found in him. In your private room, it can be found in him. 
He wants to speak into you. He wants to embolden you. He wants to mold you. He wants to use you. God has something greater for you. So today we're going to open these altars. If you want to just come see God, if you just want to come pray and talk to him, if you want to come out here, if you want to stay in your seat, whatever you're going to do tonight, I would encourage you, take a moment and pray and talk to God and be like, tell him, God, I just need strength. I just need wisdom. I just need guidance. God, I need a vision. God, I need, I need help to take that step. The Holy Spirit is called the helper. He wants to help you tonight. He wants to talk to you tonight. He wants to give you strength tonight. So we're going to go to God in prayer. These altars are open.